there, witches, seekers, and the curious. Welcome to Enigmatic, where we talk about witchcraft and explore the metaphysical mechanics of using witchcraft as a means of spiritual evolution. I'm your resident swamp witch, Stacy Marie. Glad to have you back. And if you're new here, please consider subscribing. We'd love to have you. Today, we're going to be talking about circle casting and quarter calling. We're going to get into different types of circle casting. Do you need to circle cast? Who does circle casting? How do they do it? Uh, we'll examine um, how circle casting is done in some Wiccan traditions versus how it is or isn't done in more traditional uh, witchcraft type practices. We'll get into the quarters a little bit as well. So be sure to stick with us through to the end to get all of the greatest info on circle casting quarter calling. Let's take a look at what I used to do as a Wiccan priestess with my coven when it comes to circle casting. A circle, a sphere between all realms and here, boundary, a gate, allowing all love and banishing all hate. Let's take a quick peek into a little bit of what I used to do as far as quarter calling. I call upon the elemental air, for as we possess creativity, we are kindred, inspire us. upon the elemental fire for as we possess passion and power of will we are kindred protect us now let's stop right there we will get to a full set of quarter calling later on in the video, so be sure to stick around for that. But let's talk about what we just saw. What is a circle in the first place? What is it? Why would you use it? Why do some people use it and some people don't use it in their witchcraft practice? A circle, when cast properly, really acts as a boundary. The boundary between all things, all realms, time included. It's a neutral area. It's protective and it's also a vessel or a container to contain all of the energy that's raised within it. The world is full of unseen forces and magic. The circle will act as a filter to keep out anything that may not um, be in tune with what you're trying to do. Also, magic in general tends to attract all sorts of different types of entities from all different realms. So when a witch begins to start practicing magic, if you can imagine um, just a simple spell that's done and um, with or without a circle, there is a sending, there's a building up of energy and a sending off 
um, of energy as well. A final, a final attempt to send that and direct that energy towards its specific intended intent. That can be, if you can imagine, like a beacon of light that comes out. Um, that is um, something that can be seen by all kinds of entities and energy types. And they can start to come towards that rather quickly. So a circle um, can be used to keep that contained until the final moment. And so it's a quick burst. So there's less going on as far as something for different entities that you have not intended to invite to your workings to see and gravitate towards. Um, and then also, if you're someone and fundamental level. A circle is a boundary of protection that reverberates through all worlds. And it's also a vessel or a container for energy to be collected and raised until a height of the working where it is to be released and sent out into the multiverse. A circle can be as elaborate or simple as the practitioner or practitioner's desires. Generally in Wiccan practice, uh, casting a circle is a very predetermined ritual uh, ceremonial magic type of procedure it is generally done the same way each time uh, sometimes covens will have a more formal rite of passage type of circle um, process that they utilize and one that's a little less formal for general coven workings. At least that's the way that um, Temple Zenith used to function. As far as just a brief overview of how do you actually go about casting a simple yet effective circle, Especially in the beginnings of your practice, it's probably best to physically mark out the circle in some manner. This can be as simple as tracing out a circle in sand or dirt uh, with some type of an object. Stick, finger, a thame, wand, staff whatever you want to get a little bit more elaborate with that you can mark it with salt sulfur chalk string i have painted permanent circles on concrete before um even a round rug just something that would physically outline that boundary the way that i was taught uh, to cast a circle is to, as far as like visualizations, it's always called a circle, but it's actually a sphere. So that's important to uh, keep in mind. And I was always taught to visualize the color of the circle as an electric blue color. And the visual, the visual that I taught in um, the coven was uh, specifically the color that you get when you turn on the flame of a gas stove. Many traditions 
especially uh, Wiccan and ceremonial magic traditions, will cast the circle using the athame. Some will use a wand, you can use your finger, um, those are the tools that are generally used. Swords are used as well, as was shown in my brief demonstration when you have the athame, it's about piercing the veil and then bringing that visualization of the blue out from the athame. As with any charging procedures that you do, it's always pulling that energy up through you, out through your hand and through the object. And then you want to draw the, and it's usually done at um, shoulder height or something similar to that, waist height, shoulder height, so basically the middle of the sphere, and then you draw the walls up over you and under you. Of course, there are as many words that you can say for casting a circle as there are individuals, or none at all. Um, that works as well. Of course, the words that I used in the demonstration are um, the words that we always use, the words that we used in the coven, uh, a circle, a sphere, between all realms adhere, a boundary, a gate, permitting only love and banishing all hate. Very Wiccan, um, very focused on one side of a spectrum and this is really meant from a very protective state. As far as calling the quarters, this can be referred to by many different things, calling the elementals, calling the Grigori, um, calling, the, calling the watchers, calling the quarters, a couple of reasons why this is done. <clears throat> it's both to invite these entities um, to witness your right and also to lend their energy. So um, when you think of the elementals, um, <clears throat> air, fire, water, and earth, these are the base fundamentals, the base elements of creation. So you are calling these base elements of creation to your sacred space to witness what, to both witness what you are doing and to lend energy that they are willing to lend to your ritual, your workings. This makes perfect sense since they are the cornerstones to all of creation. Um, ceremonial magic does this in a more of a demanding, commanding type of way. Wiccans tend to do this more in a asking permission, asking for the help in a <clears throat> respectful sort of way. Um, and witches just run the gamut. Always you want to be respectful whatever uh, entity it is you are calling to your quarter they are ancient powers in most cases elements the elementals the watchtowers the angel the angels the gregory the watchers the directions and countless other names uh, are all basically variations on the same concept. Um, and generally they're evoked. Now I know I have recently um, watched or read a couple of things where folks are saying the difference between evoking and invoking is when you're commanding and when you're asking. That is not what I have been taught. Um, my, um, I've always been taught that evoking with an E is to call outside of yourself and invoking with an I is to actually call something within yourself. 
So like in um, Wiccan practices, at least in my coven, we would invoke a goddess or a god. Um, we would evoke the elementals so that we would call them to our circle, but not into our being, if that makes sense. Um, I think that people have different uh, definitions of this. Uh, it's, um, I don't know what to say about that. And then obviously, uh, when you're done with your working, you actually have to deconstruct the circle, take the circle down. Um, so you thank the elements for witnessing and lending their rights. Then you walk Wittershins, if you will, opposite, uh, counterclockwise uh, to the way that you went, which should have been clockwise when you cast the circle want to go counterclockwise when you're taking the circle down. That is what I was taught. Then you visualize if you used a tool to actually cast the circle, you visualize that uh, blue fire going back into your tool. Kind of like a vacuum sucking it all back in. Now, my 33 years of practice, when I first started practicing, I always cast a circle and I mainly made every circle casting that I did very, very formal. It was a lot about um, setting the right frame of mind, getting in the right frame of mind, setting up that sacred space, helping to kind of go from a mundane uh, mindset into that ritual and magical mindset. I was very concerned about um, things going awry, I guess, um, and or attracting scary stuff. So I did it for protection on multiple levels, protecting myself and also protecting folks around me. Um, and what do I mean by that? Um, for me, witchcraft and magic uh, has never, the question has never not once been, is this going to work? It's always been, how is this going to work? And is it going to work the way that I intended it to? Is it going to work the way that I intended it to, but also have some kind of unforeseen and weird with a Y uh, consequence. I felt early on that if I called in the right entities to witness the right and lend their own energies that they could kind of um, intercept any uh, disruption that might be coming um, from within myself um, or to help direct any um, misguided assumptions that I might have been making, that sort of thing. So it was all about the protection. It was never about like, if I don't do this, it's not going to work. As I progressed, through my practice and evolved, I came to understand a couple things. I'm gonna share these and please know that these are my experiences and I love sharing them and I hope that they're very helpful to everyone. But you should have your own experiences to come to your own conclusions about what does and does not work best for you individually. Um, so through my working, my workings and my experience over the years, I came to understand that circles were more important inside, in the buildings and whatnot, the structures and buildings and whatnot that uh, humans have created, and less important outside in nature 
Um, again, and most of the things that I talk about are have multiple layers to them. And this is one of those. So um, a human built structure is going to hold on to some residual energy always. Um, so a circle does help to, like I said, contain that energy until such a point as you're ready to release it. And it's going to minimize that uh, residual energy holding on to's, if you will. Um, I also talked a little bit about the entities that seem to be just attracted to um, practicing magic, witchcraft, and spellcraft in general. And um, outside, that happens as much as it does inside, but inside, uh, you can ward your home um, to try to keep that outside. Uh, and outside doesn't have those man-made structures to hold on to the residual energy. So all of the um, things and spirits around you are going to kind of act as a filter. All of the trees and the, the flowers and the animals, they're going to kind of filter act as if they're not going to hold on to that stuff the way that a man-made building or structure does. Also, um, if you do practice magic inside without a circle and you don't have any type of any type of wards around your house, you probably are going to end up with um, what my family, what my family calls oogity boogities. We refer to them as oogity boogities. These are multiple different types of things. Generally, they're just like, um, shadow type in entities that will scuttle around in the corners. Um, if you're trying to call those types of things to use them for a particular purpose, by all means. Um, but generally they can be just you know, a little problematic, um, call them what you will, dark elves, dark fairies, shadow people, they can be a little mischievous, they can steal things, hide things, move things around, um, just cause general discourse, uh, and that's just not, um, that's not what you want in your home. Also, as I progressed um, throughout my practice, I found that I no longer needed so much pomp and circumstance, if you will, in order to practice. Um, I don't need as much building up of sacred space to get into the proper mindset to be able to practice and cast um, it is at this point pretty much for me a flip of a switch um, a couple of things um, that are done but I'm there I don't I don't need such pomp and circumstance if if you will of course everyone is going to be different and there's no like magic time frame oh, it will take you two years, three years, four years. It's going to be different with every individual. And I suppose there are some folks that um, just might not reach that at, at all, depending on how much their footing is in one world versus the next. Um, astral versus the physical. So whereas when I was younger, I would always cast a very formal circle. Now that I am older, it, it depends on a lot of things. It always just depends. It depends on the vibrational energies around me at the time. That could have to do with astrological occurrences. It could have to do with people that are in my general sphere of influence or trying to be influencers in my life. It can be um, the work that I'm trying to do. How much um, protection do I need? 
I generally do most of my practice outside. Um, I have for many, many years. I feel like that is um, just a safer place to conduct ritual, like I said, conduct spellcraft, like I said. It's not in a uh, man-made structure that's going to hold under residual energies. A lot of times, a circle is as simple to me as, as a strong visualization um, and just a quick, and it's up uh, because I've been doing it for so long. Now certainly, um, if I were to conduct any type of rite of passage, rites of passage are always deserving of pomp and circumstance, right? Um, so I would still do a very formal circle for those types of situations. Okay, I said that I would share the quarter calling uh, holistically. So that's what I'm going to go ahead and do now. I'm not going to do it in a ritual way, but I will share um, the Temple Zenith quarter calling. Um, and please feel free to use them as you like. So um, the evocation of the elements stuck for me. The evocation of the elements that we would use we would stand in the center of the circle um, at the altar and call in spirit. So we call upon you, eternal spirit, for as you permeate all, always, we acknowledge and celebrate your presence. Unite us. In the east, we call upon thee, elemental air, for as we possess thought and creativity, we are kindred, inspire us. In the south, we call upon thee, elemental fire, for as we possess passion and power of will, we are kindred, protect us. In the west, we call upon thee, elemental water, for as we possess emotion and intuition, we are kindred. Cleanse us. And finally in the north, we call upon the elemental earth. For as we possess wisdom in earthbound bodies, we are kindred. Guide us. That's all we have today. Yo. Leave comments below. If there's anything in particular that you're interested in discussing or having uh, broken down, deconstructed, and reconstructed into something new. Bye!